Hello, and welcome to RRI Explained, a RESBIOS podcast. It is the aim of the RESBIOS project to embed Responsible Research and Innovation, or RRI, into four universities across Europe in the hope of improving the interconnectivity between science research and society, with a particular focus on the biosciences. But what is RRI exactly? Well, hopefully we can find out together. Today we have a very special episode of the RRI Explained podcast because we're joined by three guests. Today we are joined by Dr. Louise Zabini, Acting Director of the International Centre of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, or the ICGB. But also we are joined by Dr. Marriott Willem, a senior scientist from Cancer Genomics Group, and Claudia Russo, who is External Communications Officer at the ICGB. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd just quite like to know a little bit more about your background. So we might just go through each of you individually and you can just give a little sound bite of your background and what you do with the ICGB and the research you do. So, uh, Luis, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm, uh, in terms of uh, science, I'm a molecular virologist, which uh, the degree I got at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And then I moved to United States to Harvard Medical School for a postdoc. In 2009, I moved to South Africa. I'm currently the acting director for the Cape Town component, as well the group leader of cancer genomics. In basically our group are performing research in many uh, cancers of African importance. Uh, which is a topic that uh, in the past was not much uh, focus for the cancer uh, community, but uh, now it's been acquiring a lot of uh, highlights and focus from the research community. Thank you very much. Uh, Marit, do you want to go next? Yes, I'm Marit, and I'm a research scientist in uh, Louise's group. So we do, like you said, research um, on cancer, And then uh, we like to focus our research to address the need of Africa. So we we do research in the the cancers that are most prominent in Africa. And um, we focus on what makes the African population unique and how we respond then or why we respond in a certain manner to the disease. And Claudia? I'm uh, Claudia Russo. I've been at ICGB for almost 10 years now. Uh, I work very closely with Luis uh, in his office, but I also work very closely with all the scientists in the research groups as well. We do a lot of the work on public info, external comments, as well as outreach. The component is very active in those fields and, you know, getting the information out there about the great work that the scientists do here. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, The ICGB Centre in Cape Town was established in 2007 and has created kind of a central hub for bioscience research, research into cancers, research into viral diseases, and just general bioscience, but also reaches out to the other ICG hubs in India and Italy, for example, but also with wider science within the UN. Could I just ask what the main focuses of the Cape Town Institutes are and the work you are doing currently? The Cape Town component was established, as you mentioned, in 2007 with the notion to benefit the most of the African continent. And just to remember that uh, the ICGB was established more than 35 years ago, and the two first components were the 3S components, in which is our headquarters, and then we have the new data component. But since the establishment in 2007, the ICGB Cape Town operates a lot of research programs focusing mainly in scientific excellence that can contribute not just to the continent for the the research communities across Africa and globally. I think we have six six groups at the moment at the component uh, focus on parasitic diseases, focus on cancer. It means we focus on infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases as well as in agriculture. Uh, with our biopesticides and our plant genomics group. And in addition to that, we have the bioinformatics group. It means that the main areas focus in Cape Town. 
I just like to highlight the ICGB as an institution that uh, has 46 laboratories across the other components as well. Since the establishment of the ICGB in Cape Town, it has really expanded throughout Africa with a lot more member states for Africa, but also with your collaborative work with the UN and these other institutes. How has this collaboration shifted focus away from Eurocentric kind of focus on research and innovation? And is this sort of sense of collaboration been beneficial for African research? ICGB has 66 member countries, but as I mentioned before, the ICGB was established in Africa based on the notion that we realized that Africa was not benefiting the most of our activities. Then uh, that's why in 2007, as I mentioned, there, there was the establishment of CGB Cape Town with the, the focus on establishing collaboration throughout the continent, focusing in, in the Northern Hemisphere countries like uh, uh, European and, uh, and the North America, and also to establish as a hub or a network that could connect all our member states. We have 66 member states. However, the African continent is the most represented continent among, among our membership. And then through this network, we could connect like more than 23 countries for enhancing capacity building research activities establishment of different networks or in agriculture and in health, also running courses and meetings. It means it did help a lot to connect the, the African uh, member states within in our network and start exchanging our research capabilities through these countries. In recent years, obviously, the state of the state of bioscience and links with society have obviously been brought up to the forefront due to the onset of COVID. But obviously, there are other diseases and other issues that face the world a little bit. The one example that comes to mind, obviously, is the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that is still prominent now, but seems to have taken a bit of a backseat to the COVID pandemic that is happening worldwide. I'm just wondering how... COVID has impacted the research you do in other fields? Has it sort of benefited bioscience research as kind of bringing it to the forefront and having enhanced this knowledge exchange? Or has there been sort of pumping the brakes on other research, do you think? Yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that with the pandemic in the beginning, all the research activities, they were shut down. Uh, even hospitals were redesigned to attend the COVID patients. It means at that time, a lot of, for example, in the health sector, a lot of uh, uh, hospitals and which uh, would have uh, elective surgeries, they cancel all these surgeries uh, and people with other diseases would be, let's put this way, on hold until uh, the hospital resumes uh, this kind of activities. And at the same time, like researchers were not able to come to the institutes and keep going with their uh, own uh, research. However, at the same time, all members of the research community found the need to get together and start working together in order to find solutions for the pandemic. Then the, in the same time that some other diseases were affected, but the research community started working together, then many, many examples how people shift their focus to COVID and their knowledge acquired throughout the years, or even for infectious disease researchers, it's much easier for them to shift the focus for COVID. I can see even by the speed that we achieve by acquiring vaccines, you know, which may take uh, a long time and uh, work effort, the, everybody working together, then we could achieve not just this, but some other measures that were put in place in order to uh, block the COVID transmission. In this sense, yes, some diseases were, uh, research towards certain diseases were affected in terms that was not the priority at that time, but at the same, the networks were built 
because of COVID that will, for me, will last for a long time in post-COVID era. How about you, Marit? How has the COVID pandemic affected the work that you do within the cancer genomics group? I would agree with Louise. I think that it really made networking much easier. It made us slow in the beginning, but I think we're back up to speed uh, because initially there was access to the labs were limited, but we're back now. And um, I think it made our network stronger and our interactions with colleagues across the world much better. And I suppose it's allowed for this co-creation, this co-working to be much more easier, I suppose, because, yes, we all do miss face-to-face interactions, but obviously this interview wouldn't take place uh, so readily if we weren't so so versed now in online communication. So I suppose having this kind of infrastructure put into place has probably helped the ICGB network expand and work more with colleagues, even if it is in a remote setting. Yeah, tremendously. Tremendously. I think it's really opened up. It's broken down the boundaries, you know, the physical boundaries that exist. And so it's much easier to, to connect with everyone, really, through platforms like this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we have a very nice example within the CGB. I can tell you other examples that I know about the, same, the, the, the community in Africa. But at ICGB, we, in partnership with the Bill Melinda Gates, we establish the Gates project that we call, which is the, the LAMP assay, is a COVID test, which is colorimetric. And then you can do in remote areas what the only thing that you need is a water bath at the 65 degrees. And initially, we within our network, we put this project in five countries in Africa and uh, to test if we will be able to do this. And we were successful. And now after being successful in five countries, we are now extending the project for additional 10 countries in Africa, uh, in which we're gonna implement this this very fast uh, COVID test. So what has been the main challenges when it comes to communicating and working with African nations, African locals with the biosciences fields? Uh, Obviously there's been a, global sort of info dump of information and misinformation and sometimes societal mistrust. But I'm just wondering if the African component to that is, if it's a different environment, really, if just because due to the variety of different populations that are in Africa, there are some that are that live in cities, but some that are remote, but also they've had issues with, as I said before, Ebola, malaria, are there different issues that face biocommunications and science communication when it comes in the field of bioscience, when it comes to the African perspective? So from our perspective, from the ICGB perspective, um, the issues, you know, challenging science and society and this, you know, bridging the gap is, is, is more of a global one. It's not specifically regional. Of course, every region has its dynamic, but um, from what we've seen, it's more of a global one. An example would be, you know, the misinformation that, that happened in recent times that became so extremely uh, evident. And um, ICGB was actually very active in trying to fight the misinformation, if we could say it in that, in that term. Um, and it wasn't just relatable to COVID-19. It was COVID-19, vaccines, cancer therapeutics, as well as, um, you know, GMOs. That sort of misinformation is, is filtering filtering around. And um, to combat this or to try and, you know, try and fight it, we recently hosted a public engagement event um, called ICGB Science and the City, which is a very popular science communication or science engagement model, where we bring scientists directly to the public. So the experts come to the public and we open it up to to anyone really, um, face to face as well as online. So that's where a platform like this was was very helpful and the topic we did actually was called Mythbusters discrediting misinformation in science where we spoke about you know is it fact or fake news and this is just one of the sort of activities ICGB does when it comes to bridging the gap or using biosciences and the information that we have to bridge the gap between science and society and bring science closer to the people Um, Another thing I think that's very good is our website, the ICGB website, and we put a lot of our talks and our podcasts that are there as well as information readily available. And that's therefore available for globally 
But then, of course, also, you know, to the African member states or the African population who are particularly interested. Another thing that I wanted to add, um, I know you mentioned like you have some people that are living in cities and some that are more, you know, rural. Um, this part of this ICGB Science in the City, we're hoping to take it across South Africa and also to be able to broadcast it in different national, South African national languages. So therefore to make it more accessible to, to the bigger population. So ICGB is we're very active in terms of public engagement and getting the science research that our colleagues do and, and taking it out there. Now, that sounds fantastic. And yeah, a really noble thing to be doing and bridging the gap between, as you say, society and the biosciences, which obviously now in so many ways is at the forefront. It's probably one of the fields that kind of impacts society most with food security, with climate change, with disease and health and that sort of thing. So yeah, the work that you're doing is, it sounds fantastic and leads quite well on to my next question, really, which is more kind of focused on responsible research and innovation, obviously RRI. The ICGB and uh, some of your members were, they work closely with the Respires project. Uh, Louise is part of the advisory board to the project, but you also worked previously with the Star BIOS project as well. So I'm just wondering how how important these initiatives are and how RRI has influenced the work that you do within the ICGB? Since the establishment of ICGB, the Institute has, has always incorporated RRR within its activities. Uh, again, not just in Cape Town, but also in Trieste, uh, New Delhi and uh, India. We try to focus on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have many examples. We have our fellowship programs in, ten, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, gender balance, uh, uh, women in science. Uh, recently, we have at least three different calls in partnership with three different uh, uh, UN offices in order to promote uh, uh, women in science. Uh, our uh, collaborative research program also uh, is focused on building human capacity and quality education. Uh, to be honest, I think working initially with the Star Bios was really good because I could see that ICGB since its establishment always been working RRI but at that time it was a different name. And then we realized after joining StarBios that that was responsible research and innovation. Then we tried to get these points that we usually, we had before and trying to increase our activities. That was really helpful for us because we could uh, visualize the points that we were doing, but not doing enough even though we were the fewest institutions doing at that time, but we realized we need to do much more in that aspect. I think Marit can add something because she is very enthusiastic about some of our programs. Yes, I, I was part of the Star Bias project, the one that was before Grace Bio. And um, uh, for me, I think it's important that we implement these um, principles throughout all our activities. I want to highlight one of the fellowship programs that you briefly mentioned, and that's the WeStar project, mostly because all the WeStar um, fellowship program, mostly because I like it. It's specifically aimed for women in science, but from Africa. These fellowships of us, ours, if you will, if you go to the website and you take a look at them, with them, we are trying to bring in gender equality, work on it, and together with that, together with youth, we believe that that should that should be the focus to nurture a bright future. These are essentially the cross-cutting themes in the ICGB's approach to RRI, and uh, all our activities reflects this. No, it seems that a lot of like the RRI principles, the five keys are obviously things that were in the back of people's minds before the instigation of RRI, but the formalization of the principles just sort of brought it to the forefront and kind of gave a framework for research institutes, just as yourselves, or universities, 
or even businesses really to just sort of rethink how they approach these issues within the framework and to just put it at the forefront and not as an afterthought really. So having that kind of link between society and research and promoting the greater good of the world really, I suppose, and having, yeah, just having the forethought to think about the research you're doing. Obviously with the ICGB, a lot of that is very directly impacts society and that sort of thing. But using these keys, it feels that you are connecting greater with society and just sort of addressing some of the, addressing some needs that need to be changed throughout as kind of a climate shift for uh, research as a whole, it seems. Is there any other projects that the ICGB are doing that you'd like to highlight at this moment in time? I was, I was, no, I was just thinking, okay, so one of the projects or program that's now become a marked activity in our in our calendar uh, we, have, we normally host between three to four school visits every year where we have about 20 learners from different schools around uh, Cape Town and Greater Cape Town they come to the ICGB for the day and they are scientists for the day they get to engage with our researchers like Marit and Louise and many others in all the different research groups that Louise had already mentioned and they get to do hands-on activities So it's another way that we try to, you know, look at education, for example, in RRI. We also often have quite a lot of young girls or women learners that that come. So again, we focus on the gender. And um, so they get to be in the labs with us for the full day. And we try to then encourage, encourage, you know, careers and in the bioscience. But uh, one of the key parts of our school outreach program is we do work with the fault scope. I don't know if you know about it. It's a paper microscope. It, it costs about $1 per microscope and it has a magnification of 140. 140, oh. like Marit mentioned. Marit does quite a lot of um, the, you know, she does a lot of the hands on when it comes to the fault scope. And um, it's really incredible because it's essentially we can take these fault scopes, these paper micro- microscopes, and go out into low resource settings and um, encourage, you know, the youth to get out there and to, and to be interested. So I thought that would be a nice project to, you know, to highlight that we do. We do many projects across many cross-cutting themes, but the school outreach one with the highlight of the fault scope is, is, is very popular. Yes, with the oh. program, we're really trying to put the, let the students do the research. So we put the pipette in their hands. We gave them uh, the safety equipment, of course, and then we let them do the experiments. And they really enjoyed it. And the first time they would see, uh, we always have a little bit of pond water to look at under the microscope in the fold scope. And the first time they see something move there, the um, excitement is just contagious. That, that is another project that uh, in terms of RRI that I'd like to mention is not really a project, something that ICGB is doing a lot. Just to go through the conversation, which is regarding the one of the other pillars of RRI, which is the open access. I just want to highlight that ICGB is working on open access for a long time. We have uh, every single talk or event that we have, we record this, this event or this talk, and we put freely available in our website. Currently, we have more than 600 uh, uh, records in our library. And this started a long time ago, even probably remember in the beginning, you remember iTunes, right? The only, the only platform they have for you to buy music. At that time, ICGB already have an agreement with iTunes and we put usually, we put our records in the iTunes for free. So I think it was the only thing for free. I'm not sure he's speaking here on the correction. And now we have many other platforms like uh, uh, YouTube, etc. And then uh, we've been uh, able to put this for free in our website also can help for educational purposes. Let's say someone in the middle of Africa, you know, uh, is teaching molecular biology. He can go to our library and get uh, the talk of one expert in molecular biology in some areas and can use that talk as a starting point for a class in the middle of a low resource setting. No, it sounds amazing. And it's just you're putting out these resources just available for other science communicators or educational leads just to sort of either work directly with the ICGB or to facilitate their own sort of 
science communication or curriculum teaching just to sort of incorporate real science and real researchers into, yeah, and bring them to the forefront as either role models or just sort of to collaborate with their teaching, I suppose. And that sounds fantastic. And just to reiterate, I used to be I used to be a freshwater scientist, so I do understand the joys of looking down a microscope and seeing a tardigrade or a water bear for the first time. And I imagine the kids love that. For sure, they do. They the excitement is very high. The this this few screams in there, it's really it's really a, a very engaging project. And sometimes we work with other institutions uh, because Manu Parash from Stanford is the guy who created this. And uh, we, uh, uh, we work with him, but we also work with other institutions which uh, are working with sometimes with children uh, in different countries. We sometimes even donate these photoscopes for them to run like a workshop with the kids, which is also quite interesting, which is complete, is different from the excellent science in the labs, you understand? But at the same time, it's, everything is, gonna, is connected. Yeah, as you say, everything's interconnected. It's just bringing science to young people who will then disseminate it to their parents or their guardians or the communities. And hopefully through that, that web of kind of communication, you can just build that foundation of the importance of bioscience and the work that you do at the ICGB. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for having you us. us. You let us know and I hope we The RESBIOS project is funded by the EU with the grant number 872146. To learn more about the RESBIOS project and the other pillars of RRI, please go to resbios.eu. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.